Welcome to Re-Review, where we watch movies from our past with a perspective from today. Your hosts are Matt, Bobby, and Austin, and we love the films from our youth, so we're taking a look back to see if they still hold up. On this episode, we are discussing The Cabin in the Woods. Released in 2012, directed by Drew Goddard, it stars Kristen Connolly, Chris Hemsworth, Anna Hutchinson, Fran France, Jesse Williams, Richard Jenkins, Bradley Whitford, Brian White, and Amy Acker. Lots of names on this one. This movie helps us to understand where our nightmares come from. Now, this is a fair warning. We're spoiling an 11-year-old movie, so if you haven't seen it, we will be revealing key plot points. So, horror films, right? This is a horror film? I, <laughs> if we think about how this opens, yes, we are... all of them. We we were uh, we were introduced to a very what clinical work situation, right? A, a sort of a, a factory warehouse scenario, maybe like a government uh, a secret base type of thing, where you're just kind of seeing employees get together to do their job, and uh, and you get a few laughs, and and the setup, you just don't necessarily know what you're getting into, right? It definitely throws you for a loop. I'm not going to lie going into this movie when I watched it the first time. I don't think that I had a clear idea of what the movie was. I think I very much went into it thinking it was a traditional horror movie. And so starting it off that way definitely will throw you off any mindset you might have. You don't quite know where it's going just from that. They very much, they would have started it where it starts after the title it would have been a little bit more in line with a standard horror movie, but starting it off in that scenario, it definitely throws you off. Like the, it tells you it's not a normal movie by and far. And it's something that I feel even, even now uh, it's so unexpected because you're, you're just almost put in a place of ease and calm and, and Bobby, what do they do to take that calm away from you? Are you talking about the like title smash cut with the <laughs> yes. scream sound yes. effect on it? Yes. No, I, I love that. I thought that was really great because, I mean, nowadays there's there's no title at all. And I mean, if you're going to have a title, like use it, which is great. It, it I literally jumped. And considering oh, I have so seen I. this movie before, it's kind of interesting to be. If enough time passes, I forget all jump scares, apparently. Um, <laughs> and having the title be the thing that makes you go, oh, wait, what? And, and then and then you get cut into into all of our lovely, lovely characters. Um, you know, getting to who they represent at the end of the film. We're we're meeting these these five characters who kind of are supposed to be uh Worthy of sacrifice is the is the best way that I'm going to put it for the different roles that they represent. But we're introduced to them in such like a kind and and nice way that it's just kind of a group of friends that are planning a trip together. Um, don't get me wrong; it felt like all the late '90s films, a little bit of a, um, a Jennifer Love Hewitt, a little bit of <laughs> Scream, a so little bit of all of that going on when you meet these characters. Were they already friends and then they were selected because they kind of fit that stereotype of all those things that they were looking for? Or was that like kind of like orchestrated and created or? I mean, based on the gentlemen we see on top of their home, it seems they were 100% selected for it. Right. I'm just trying to figure out how far down the conspiracy goes. I mean, isn't it ultimately so far that that we we don't actually get the insight into how deep it really went? But it seems like they really, really looked out to choose these people. I mean, I think at the very least, I don't think that it was a case where like, you know, this is jumping way towards the end. But the whole premise was like they're going to the cousin's uh, cabin or whatever. And it turns out later they don't even think the cousin even actually exists. I don't think mm-hmm. that they went out of their way to gather because I feel like if that were the case. They would have actually... Again, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, they would have got the actual virgin character rather than saying we work with what we got. I think if they were mm-hmm. literally like, because it does almost imply like, you know, they they are almost creating like memories and stuff like that, like with, mm-hmm. with the whole cousin thing. So if they were that powerful, they probably could have just picked and placed the exact people they needed because I still am not entirely sure that Holden is like the like the genius character or whatever. Not that he wasn't a smart character or anything like that, but mm-hmm. you know, 
considering what his, you know, he's on the football team and, and everything else. He just, I feel like if you really wanted to get their nerd character, I'm sure they probably could have found one. It almost felt like they were kind of forcing him into that role. Same thing with like, uh, Kurt. They said the guy was coming from state to play football. Yeah. Like, that doesn't fit the genius. And not no, that can't you guys just bash. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that there's, you know, anything necessarily wrong with, you know, the, the approach that they took. I mean, I think that was kind of the thing is almost all these characters were playing against type. Mm-hmm. They were also well, Dana. Dana was our virgin. Uh huh. Kurt, that's Chris and Connolly. Kurt, Chris Hemsworth was our, our, the athlete. But I think what you're describing makes sense because he gives, Kurt gives Dana a better book to read. Yeah. So there's a, there's right. clearly a showing of Kurt being an intelligent person as well, that he's more than an athlete. And we also have, it's Fran Kranz. I messed up his name earlier. <laughs> we have Marty um, who comes in, who talks about how, Kurt's character acts when he's drunk Mm -hmm. and how the things and what they're doing as they experience the, the cabin don't line up with how these people are normally processing. Um, uh, Marty was of course the fool. Jules was the whore. So cruel. And (laughs) Holden played the scholar and, and really, uh, you know, we can get into the first characters we meet and how lovely they are, even though we meet this group of friends and they're going to go through this process. Uh, Bradley Whitford as Hadley and Richard Jenkins as Sitterson. Um, tell me how much you love them. I think a they're lot. great. Yeah. Yeah. I think like, and I mean, I said it multiple times when we're watching it. Like, you know, I feel like if you're going to do a movie, especially in the horror genre, you very much have to make likable characters because if you don't care for them, seeing them killed, it makes you not worry for them. It makes you not affected nearly as much by their death or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a single character in this entire movie that I didn't think was likable to some extent. I think that the main cast was likable. I think that all the quote unquote bad guys, the, I don't know what you want to call them, the, the organization or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, they, they were all super likable. I mean, even Mordecai, even Mordecai was likable. <laughs> like they, they took a character that should have been completely intolerable. You know, he was Am I on speakerphone. It was amazing. <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point because uh, we meet Mordecai at a gas station. They have this very just dark, depressing kind of conversation with this guy who's clearly bigoted and a terrible person. And then they take that, that image you get of him, the, the, that feeling you get and he's doing his doom and gloom speech about how it's going to be the end of the world. And to just cut that up, to chop it into am I on speakerphone and to run it as a gag, it just feels so good to, again, bring some levity to to, to that dark feeling that you can get from it. That monologue was great. <laughs> he's trying to get so doom and gloom and then have it just like, I think that was just the ongoing <laughs> thing about this movie was you could have you know, it going in a certain direction and it's completely flipping on its head. You could have, you know, a bunch of moments of levity and all of a sudden somebody's getting their head chopped off. Like that, that just happened multiple times throughout it where they, they took the moment that you would think it was going and then just flipped it. And I think his monologue was a great example of that. Literally Mm -hmm. like this very, you know, uh, almost, uh, I don't know what you'd call like old Testament, approach to like what he was saying That's a great way and Mm -hmm. and then all Mm -hmm. of a sudden he's just some guy like he's he's Mm -hmm. you know somebody like it could be an office call right Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. i i almost want to see the organization as a tv show like it would be (laughs) great to see these characters in like the office type setting Oh, that'd be so good just to see their daily in and out. Plus, we know that this is occurring across the world, this entire process, but we can get into that part. Um, let's talk about the the actual movies, the name. It's it's The Cabin in the Woods. Mm-hmm. Tell me your impressions of The Cabin. And this could be the initial impression that, you, that we get into, but ultimately our, our five characters go to this cabin, and there's a lot that happens there. How do you feel about it as the theme? Well, it totally plays into the stereotype of horror movies very, very well. And at, the, and at first I thought, oh, okay, I, I see what they're doing, not this, you know. But then it just 
kept upping itself and upping itself and upping itself. So I thought that it was it was just really fun to see it unfold as it went on. I think that I had the same kind of reaction that I think Dana did, right? Like when they first approached the cabin, right? it looked small. <laughs> it looked really, I mean, all of them were kind of hesitant about it. But once they walked in, it looked like suspiciously bigger than it looked like mm-hmm. on the outside. And mm-hmm. it, you know, less a cabin, more a lodge, right? At that point, like it very much looked like a little bit more of a reasonable space to stay in. Mm hmm. And it, you know, the, no, go ahead. It very much, like I said, it, it plays into the stereotype of what these kind of movies are, um, you know, very much in line with the typical slasher movies and monster movies that you'd see in horror. Like it's, you know, it's almost always in a cabin, right? Like you think of like the Friday the 13th movies and the mm-hmm. whole bunch of them. the only movie I feel like was in line with this, where it was kind of like a play on that genre was uh, uh Tucker and Dale versus evil again. in like a, a, a cabin esque environment where it very much sets up, you know, look, this is what it's going to be. But by the way, we're going to spin it and show you a completely different point of view of how a movie like that would happen or the behind the scenes almost of how it would happen. Different perspective. But I like, the, you know, just the little things with like the two way mirror and the setup there in terms of, okay, what is maybe the history of this particular home? Um, the, the element of what really kicks off the, the monster party of going down into the basement and that quintessential line of the, the thing opening and Kurt goes, maybe it was the wind. <laughs> Right. And you're just like, what? <laughs> well, I really liked how he, when he saw the the mirror, he, he eventually said like, okay, stop. This isn't what we're going to do, which in and of itself is pretty like atypical for yeah, other kinds of common horror movies. Like there's a lot of movies where like a lot of all the characters are just gross. And this one is already like, okay, like let's be a little different. Oh, you're thinking you're thinking of Holden, right? When he's taking yeah, the Holden the with the with yeah. the two way mirror, yeah. Mm-hmm. But really, kind of giving life to exactly what you described, and I think this could take us down that hole. We're going down the stairs. What are you playing with? What did you see in that room that was most interesting to you? What what do you what do you what called to you? <laughs> I feel like me and Bobby would be definitely pulling out that film, throwing yeah. it into a projector and. Probably ending up right. in a sinister situation or whatever. <laughs> well, we had that we we looked at the monster names. What one would the film even be? I I don't know. Like because there was nothing. Because I said while we're watching, I was like, I wonder what kind of monster would be tied to a film. I think what was it Bobby had mentioned maybe it could have been like the the you know the ring or the grudge type situation. Mm-hmm. But I, like nothing in particular like stands out as being like what would be a you know, acknowledge, uh, you know, just like it's ghostbusters and the stay puff <laughs> marshmallow, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can you fight the urge to touch? And there's such an element here, of, you know, when you're going into the idea of the tropes, especially with horror and the things that, uh, people do. And I, you know, we had so many moments where Marty was just like, let's not do the thing that right. everyone does in these scenarios. <laughs> right. And we're in, you know, we're in that basement looking at all the things to touch. And it is so hard to avoid uh, grabbing hold of things like that. But I, I loved nothing more than her reading through this diary. And she says, there's Latin. And he just almost like cuts her off to say, you're not reading that. Like right. there's no reason for you to read the Latin. Drawing a line in the sand. No, yeah. I agree. I don't. I, I, if I were in that situation, I'd be like, yeah, we're not reading that, Wait, especially as creepy as it sounded. Like, would you have even gone down? Like, when that thing cracked open, would you have gone down into the basement in the first place? I would have been very unhappy. <laughs> Let's say this. I would have been very unhappy. You, you notice I asked where was uh, where was Dana's flashlight? She had it in her hand, but it wasn't on until she'd already taken like 10 steps down. That right. flashlight would have been on. I, I would have bought that, I don't know, some $200 flashlight with like 10,000 LEDs. So I'm shining the <laughs> brightest light. Because <laughs> once that burn holes and stuff. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm like, I ain't messing around here. I'm the one who's going to scare the monsters. There's too much light. <laughs> so really that was the kickoff they played with all these different things and and ultimately this was a very much i feel like a love 
for for monster films right Mm -hmm. because there was just so many different variations as we learn uh that things could have happened this movie could be done so many different ways the way they could have uh interacted with these characters and they end up landing on on doing the the zombie redneck family as they called it um which i think was great because you know it gave a slow pace in terms of how they were going to handle dealing with these dramatic monsters i can't imagine how it would have been with other monsters but you know thinking of that list did you I asked you about the toy. You said the film. Did you have a favorite monster in the film? Would you have preferred to see something other than the Buckners coming to kill kill the five? Wait, did did they say that the red that the redneck family was something else, or this was the redneck family? This was the redneck. This family. was the redneck. Yeah. Family. Oh, was yeah. it? Okay, okay. Zombie redneck torture family. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, one that I would have liked to have seen other than. The Buckners. It's got to be the Merman. Well, like, I mean, that brings it. I mean, we we talked about what we're watching this. Like, I feel like some of these wouldn't have really held up as, like, I feel like they would have, like, made it through. I mean, like, the little the little dancer girl, whatever. Um, I don't know. Was that supposed to be the Sugar Plum Fairy, potentially? I think so. Like, I think so. I like I I think, like I said, I think Kurt could have probably did the whole thing he did with uh, uh, Crap, what was her name? the one arm zombie girl where he like did the running mm-hmm. clothesline and took her out. <laughs> I feel like could have taken out the good, sugar plum yeah. fairy pa- patient <laughs> patience. <laughs> so like, and like the merman, I'm like, yeah, it did go on land and take, you know, towards the end of the movie. But I'm like outside of the water. Couldn't really mm-hmm. do anything. I'm sure mm-hmm. the sugar plum fairy has got some superpower of death that we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime the wraiths came up, like I said, I don't, I don't even know how you fight that, but that's a, that's a different thing entirely. I think one of my favorite things is just sort of them, the, the melding, uh, the merging of this idea of it being such a, like a corporate way of doing things with all this tech that's involved with the idea of the old. Cause at the end of the day, we're dealing with something that's supposed to be ancient. They kept make, making that reference to, to the ancient nature of everything that they were dealing with. And I really like just kind of seeing this, very modern way of okay well we're here in the modern world but we still have to deal with this asian stuff so this is how we're taking care of it well speaking now, of the tech did they did they explain like what happened with the upstairs and the and the weird glitch that was marty Mar- oh Mar- yeah. oh marty oh, okay right 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 okay thank you so him shorting something caused it so they couldn't create the avalanche. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that was good. Yes. Block okay. their, block that, their that, that was kind of a, a, a leap from my point of view. The fact that like, I, I get his pot was giving him superpowers, but him, him being able to like mess with so much stuff from that one panel, like that and the purge button <laughs> are a little bit too convenient. Right. Well, right. what about the fact that he survived? We saw him get drugged down and blood squirting up. Right. Trying to do that little, uh, yeah, I know. Like you would think they would have had enough cameras to see what was going yeah, on. Yeah, that he made it through. Yeah, that he drug him into the elevator area or that panel area, and and it's convenient and took care of the the zombie. Yeah, or or they just thought that he was the stoner and didn't give him any, you know, chance of living at all. Like mm-hmm. they're they were saying that the girl, they're like, oh well, I kind of like her because she seems like she's got some spirit and some tenacity. Well. The same could be said about Marty. I mean, how much of this is, uh, it's just hunger games, right? (laughs) They were trapped (laughs) in sort of their own little world bubble that they couldn't get out of. Did you like that discovery piece in terms of having, you know, when we see Kurt try to launch his, uh, his, uh, motocross bike with no ramp across a ravine (laughs) and then hitting this, this sort of, uh, invisible wall. Can you imagine Hunger Games? They're like, I, you're going to volunteer for this to become a celebrity to be murdered so that you could be a sacrifice for the ancient gods. Yes, you just validated my statement. Hunger, <laughs> yes, Hunger Games I, to I, the I did, T's. Yes. <laughs> Hunger Games to the absolute I team. do. I, I, I validate it. So for the Bugners, I do want to ask this question. How do you become so adept at killing people with a bear trap? <laughs> a half that seems trap. really hard to use you just grab people in the middle of their backs and then pull them towards you apparently 
I, I just, every time I was just like, wait, how is he actually doing the attack process? Because that seems like a very unwieldy weapon. Yeah, and he used it like, well, he hit Kurt with it, kind of knocked him down. He actually used it to latch on to, uh, uh, crap, what was her name? Um, Jules. Jules. Um, so latched onto her. I think he, he latched on to Holden and pulled him up, right? Uh, when mm-hmm. they were in the black room. Mm-hmm. So he used it quite a bit. So he is actually pretty good at it. He's pulling some Indiana Jones level you know, <laughs> right? control with it. Um, All right. So whose death did you favor the most? You mean out of the the main characters? Out of the five. Well, okay. Not that everyone died, but <laughs> out of the three. The one that probably shocked me the most was probably Holden's. Yeah, so. mm. um, it was probably like yeah. it was one thing I think I, I wrote down when I was watching. It. I was like, even though this movie has like a lot of levity and comedy in it, and it's a nice perspective on horror movies in general, um, it was shockingly like gory. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. uh, Jules getting her hand stabbed, and like, yeah, her her decapitation was off screen. Uh, Holden getting the the blade through his his neck, whatever. I don't know mm. why. I can't not laugh during Kurt's death. I don't know if it's the sound effect or what. And it's such a, it's such a built up moment. It's so heroic, but (laughs) him falling down the wall. I, I don't know why, but it does. And I know I should it. It makes a lovely sound. I'm not going to lie. Every hit on the invisible wall is like this perfect resonance of like the glass. You, it's like you could feel it. And they did that a couple times. There was when they opened the door to the cabin. I mentioned it just feels like you could feel that door because the sound they used and the creaking level. Right. You yeah. could just feel kind of it edging along as if you're opening that door. I think, Matt, you mentioned the music being something that you enjoyed. Oh, very much. Like, I think that. The actual score, I think, was really well done. Like, I like the kind of main theme. The like, it's it's not like a very bombastic theme. I could very much imagine somebody was on a keyboard composing this theme originally. Um, mm-hmm. but, I liked how they had the like glorious chorus during the unicorn stabbing yes. scene. <laughs> it was that the 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 clown music, like it was all really well done. Yeah. It was all. I mean, like I said, the the heroic music that plays during Kurt's. You know, dirt bike ride to nowhere. Um, <laughs> that you laugh at. Yes. I, like, mm-hmm. I think that was all really well done. And even the music that, uh, you know, the actual songs or whatever that was put in, um, none of it felt like particularly gratuitous or anything like that. Like, uh, you know, they were putting like a you know, Chumbawamba in there or anything like that. It all kind mm-hmm. of worked for the scenes that they did use it. I mean, it was like the opening scene. Um, you got one. You got the scene when they were throwing the party in the organization's bunker or whatever. Um, I feel like it was all really well placed. I think they, you know, did a really good job on the music on both fronts. When we look at the idea that they're doing this all over the world, what was the frequency that they say they're doing these sacrifices? I think it's like once a year. I thought, oh my gosh, that is so frequent. <laughs> I mean that that was <laughs> that is that, that was like there. It seems really hard to control. Well, I mean, I think that was the reason why, like. The, um, I'm the one, the one that threw me off was, uh, was it Buena Aries or whatever? There was like a giant King Kong with devil horns. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. how'd they take uh-huh. that thing down? Like, like, was it just a kaiju fight and like the military got involved or like, I can't yeah. imagine there's five kids, you know, who are taking that thing down. Right. If it's all over the world like this and you're right, there was a King Kong presentation. How do they hide this? Uh, I guess they don't. I guess it's implied that this kind of stuff does, you know, I mean, the one thing that I liked the most about the movie, you know, was the fact that it makes you think about other movies, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, cause I, I think I've probably, you know, watched movies with you guys that had like zombies in it. And one of the things I always complain about is the fact that I was like, why do they always do these zombie movies? And then it takes place in a world where zombie movies don't exist. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like so, you always get like these ridiculous, you know, Walker and all these kind of weird names for them. No one will actually say the word zombie. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess right. this is just a world where that kind of stuff does happen, and you know, they just write it off. I suppose. I do think that's probably a little bit of a stretch. Like I don't know if they showed every single place that was on there, but I think that it at least was a nice. Uh, throwback to if you are like a horror fan of an international variety 
Mm-hmm. You could probably sit there like, oh yeah, I recognize that kind of horror movie. Like I think they showed South Korea, like there's a couple and they're like the host or whatever. Like you could probably, mm-hmm. you know, draw parallels too. So I love I mean, the schoolgirl a- scene. That was so the the Japanese schoolgirls. I love how they got in a circle and held hands and sang and it turned their demon creature into a frog like a happy little frog like it was like it was so perfect but that's the part you know i guess it's almost like with we originally see those japanese girls and they're running for their lives right so what was the switch for them to figure out how to deal with it like where's the education to be like oh we just need to sing and we'll take care of this ring like creature maybe one of them just sang out of like I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to sing. And then the thing like shrieked like in a quiet place or whatever, and they discovered like, okay. okay. I love everything like- you do in there, Bobby. But <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, is that the solution to the Buckners too? <laughs> to get into right. a circle and sing around the zombies? <laughs> right. <laughs> they fall asleep. Oh, that would, that would be fantastic. Well, we know at the end of the day, this is a story, a, a story about, um, well, actually what I wanted to say was clearly this is a love letter to, to horror films, right? Mm-hmm. I, they, there's so much to me, care and love, even with the humor that's put in here to, to really just say, look, I know we're dealing with tropes. We're going to make fun of them in a way that, that is entertaining, but we're also going to, you know, show you that we actually love this stuff a lot. Um, our main theme at the end of the day is that there are gods that are being, uh, kept at bay um the ideas that are evil we don't really know but it's about the end of humanity uh are you willing to sacrifice your friend to save all of humanity or are you gonna let humanity burn wow it depends put- on which friend <laughs> <laughs> putting us on the spot wow <laughs> you two guys yes yeah. some of my other friends no wait you you'd let us you'd let no, us no, live no. so the rest of the world could die <laughs> no and I, then, I, and I, then, I, wait wait <laughs> Well, okay, I do think that it's actually, uh, you know, kind of throwing that out there. So Gordy Weaver's character as the director shows up. There it is, yep. And Mm -hmm. basically explains what's going on and gives the whole story to the only two survivors at that point, Dana and Marty. And very much, you know, poses the, the, you know, the conundrum to the two, which is, you know, you can continue to fight this. And you're going to die anyways, along with everyone else, or you can be killed and everyone else survives. And Marty very mm-hmm. much, and again, a genius, uh, you know, way of writing it very much at the beginning of Marty's, you know, story, he kind of wants to put it to the system, right? He doesn't really yeah. like the way things are set up. And, you know, and when they're first driving in the RV, they set that up, right? That he kind of wants, you know, to see things, you know, he wants to see chaos. And when Mm -hmm. given the choice, he's like, you know what, you know, you're giving me a choice, you know, between a world where my friends have to die for everyone else in painful, terrible ways, or, you know, screw you guys. We're just going to see the whole thing burn. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do question how they got a bunch of gods in the hole in the first place. (laughs) That is a whole different conversation, right? That's and, another and how movie. they're kept in there, yeah, with just that small amount of sacrifice. Apparently, their Netflix subscription is all it takes to get them in there binging. <laughs> yeah, how are they? How are they doing the video feed for that down, down to them? Mm-hmm. Omnipotence, so they can watch it. No, no password sharing. Oh, right. yeah, definitely, definitely right. no password sharing at all. <laughs> oh, that's too on the nose. Um. You know, it's. I, I feel like it's just one of these films that uh, I'm. I'm also. I'm happy to go back to. We'll ask the question we always ask. Bobby, you recommending this film? Yeah, absolutely. It's great. It's great. Definitely. And if and the less information you know about it going into it, the better. I think so. Watch it first. Well, that doesn't then help listen with our to re-review. us. <laughs> no, wa- watch it first, and then and then check us out. Yeah, definitely a heed to our spoiler warning. Matt, are you telling people to watch this? Absolutely. I think that definitely if you're a horror fan, but even if you're not, I think that you can watch this movie and enjoy it for what it is. I mean, the fact that you enjoy this movie, Austin, even though you're not the biggest fan of mm-hmm. horror movies, mm-hmm. I, I think is a testament to the quality of the movie, the quality of the acting, the quality of the characters. And yeah, it's it's got jump scares in there and... You can get squeamish about it, but at the end of the day, it's 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 just a labor of love. And I think that 
that makes it such an enjoyable movie to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to agree with both of you. It's one of these where it's I this is an easy repeat watch for me to throw on. And I'd be happy if someone says, oh, I've never seen it. Let's watch it. Or, oh, yeah, I haven't watched it in a while. Let's throw it on. It's uh, it's just always very pleasant to to consume this particular movie for its entertainment value. It's 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 always very good. Um, as always, thank you for listening. And remember, we are not who we are. <laughs>